Welcome to Hiraith, the home of modern Welsh politics. Today we discuss the dog that's finally barking, Englishness, the political force that is transforming Britain's political landscape and potentially changing the political union of Great Britain forever. And to discuss their new book, Englishness, we have with us Professor Elsa Henderson, Professor in Politics at the University of Edinburgh. Hello, Elsa. Hello. And Professor Richard Wynne-Jones, Professor of Politics and Director of the Wales Governance Centre at Cardiff University. Hello, Richard. Jumai. Jumai. Thank you both for, for being with us today. So um, you've both been examining English identity for many years uh, in things such as the Future of England surveys. Is that where the idea from the book came from? We'd been doing work on this for around 10 years and we got to a certain point where we'd been publishing kind of reports through the IPPR, a couple of reports with the IPPR, a couple of things, uh, something with the ESRC and we'd been going to brief various politicians and literary festivals and all this kind of stuff and we thought right we need to we need to pull all of this together and we need to try and explain properly what's going on here and what I what I mean by explain properly is we had bits of arguments which we developed and we wanted to integrate them all together and we wanted vitally to actually show that the various trends in public opinion, the various aspects of public opinion that we've been talking about individually all mapped together into something. So it was the same people who were uh, Eurosceptic, who were also devo-anxious, as we call it, so therefore in particular focused um, on Scotland getting too much of a good thing out of the UK. We wanted to kind of formally show these relationships as well. And then we started writing in 2016 properly. And of course, one of the problems, one of the challenges we've had since then is that everything keeps changing constantly. And so, so it has been a bit of a challenge in terms of when do we stop? Because you know there was a general election in 2017, general election in 2019. We've been writing in the midst of this almost unprecedented crisis. And it's our argument that the crisis is related fundamentally to what the book is about, but actually trying to negotiate that wasn't straightforward. To many of our listeners, they probably think that Englishness and Britishness are quite synonymous with each other and they're quite pervasive forces. How would you say that Englishness is distinct from Britishness? Oh, so that's uh, that's a good one, in part because the, the answer is a very classic kind of academic, well, it depends. So. On the on the one hand, they're very similar, right? And they and and this is it. It's no surprise in a way that people tend to conflate them. And and when we ask people, well, what makes you proud um, when you think of England? What what's a source of of pride for you? We asked about what people think of England. We asked about what people think of Britain, and the answers were fairly similar you know people think of the similar similar kinds of institutions and and values when they think of england that they mention when they think of when they think of britain right so on the one hand they are quite tangled together in people's minds but where we are able to kind of tease them apart is in the relationship between people who prioritize certain identities and what their other attitudes are and so people who prioritize an English national identity have, have different attitudes to those who prioritize a, a British identity. So English identifiers are, are more likely to be anxious about devolution, devo-anxious, more likely to believe that the Scots are getting uh, unfair resources, um, kind of a greater fear about undue Scottish influence. They are more... You're a skeptic. But one of the things that's been quite interesting for us when we were writing this book was that we, we've not just been gathering data on England, but also in Scotland and Wales as well. And so one thing that's been quite interesting for us is looking at how British identifiers are actually quite different, depending on where in Britain they live. So it's so the, the answers in some ways are very similar. Englishness and Britishness are quite similar, but but identities align differently with different attitudes in different parts of the state. And that's true of of English and, and British identifiers. All I'd add to that is I think one of the one of the key key arguments that we we've tried to make in the book and which we're taking every opportunity to restate when we're talking about it is that it's a mistake to think about Englishness 
through the lens of Welshness, Scottishness, and Irishness. Mm. Okay, this is a this is a kind of pervasive tendency because, on the whole, to the extent that you know political scientists think about or people talking about politics think about national identity and nationalism in the UK context, it's something that's associated with the Celtic fringe. It's not something that you find at, at the English core of the state. And so there's a tendency then when, when, when you use the phrase English nationalism, people are going, well, that, that doesn't make any sense because people in England are not rejecting Britishness, right? They're waving Union Jacks, not necessarily across the St George. So it's not like Welsh nationalism, Scottish nationalism or Irish nationalism. So it's not a thing. And what we've shown in the book is actually English nationalism is much more akin to kind of late 19th century Irish, Scottish and Welsh nationalism, which were both a sense of, you know, Scotland, Ireland and Wales matter, or in this case, England matters, but also we're still really proud of Britain. Britain is our place, right? And so English nationalism combines this uh, kind of valorization of England and Britain at the same time. And that is one of the things which confuses people because we're so used to thinking of this as somehow being analogous to Scotland, Wales and Ireland, and it isn't. Do the English identifiers conform to any particular type of demographic? Is there trends within the age groups or the gender groups or the uh, racial groups, Elsa? Yes, um, we are able to we are able to identify kind of demographic predictors of folks who are more likely to describe themselves as English identifiers. The social class plays a plays a, a, a role here. But one of the thing that that's been quite interesting to us and in, in terms of when when we look at this is that we're always asked questions about whether where you live in England matters. Um, and there's this expectation that surely there must be a variation in this depending on whether you're in London or out or whether you're in the north or the south or the east or the west. And one of the things that's been so interesting for us um, looking at kind of demographic and socioeconomic predictors is that we're not really seeing significant variation by region. So there is a bit of an exception with London, um, but we think that's largely composition effects. It's largely because of the type of people that tend to um, settle in London or migrate to London, but there's no meaningful difference um, across England in terms of the trends that we're seeing. That's not to say that people's local identities don't matter to them, but just that, that we're not seeing regional variations, both in the strength of English national identity, but also the way in which English national identity aligns with other attitudes. So I think the uh, thing to add to that, and I think it's implicit in that, but just to make it explicit, since the 2016 referendum in particular, there's been this whole focus on the left behind, right? And the, the poor Eastern seaboard towns of England. This has been the heartland of Euroscepticism and therefore for the centre, centre left, of course, then the answer is, is this is a socioeconomic issue. What we need is a socioeconomic answer and therefore all will return to normal, right? And, and our, our analysis is, is quite different from that. So it's, it's stressing national identity, showing that actually this national identity isn't simply in the eastern seaboard towns or in the red wall areas. It's also in, it's in the St Surrey stockbroker belt. It's, you know, so what we're, what we're, we're kind of presenting a, a, an understanding of British politics, which is really quite different from the the, the ways that British politics has been understood uh, traditionally. And we're saying that, look, this is, this is not just confined to a particular place or a particular class, although you can, you can say interesting things about that, but this is, this is much wider. It's already taken the UK out one union and we'll see what happens to the other one in the, in the, in the next few years. Well, we'll get onto that. I wouldn't worry, but um, it may be beneficial for maybe beneficial for some of our listeners to sort of understand how you're measuring this. So, would you, would someone be able to give a brief explainer on the Moreno scale and uh, and what exactly it is that you've been measuring in these uh, polls? Um, oh, you can tell I'm already excited talking about measurement and things. Um, so we 
We ask about identity in loads of different ways. One of the ways we ask about it is the is the Moreno question or what in Spain is the Lintz question. But it's um it forces people to consider the relationship between two different identities that they might have, one at the state and one at the sub-state level. So in England it would be English, not not British. England, English more than British, equally more British than English, British not English. That's one way we look at it, um, the Marino question. And it's quite good because we have a fairly long time series on that. So we can see how attitudes have, have changed over time. But another way we ask about identity is to ask, look, if we have this big long list of possible national identities, which ones apply to you? And then another way we can look at it is by saying, right, okay, you have this big long list, but now we're going to force you to pick just one from that list, which one best applies to you. And then another thing we do is we say, right, given those ones you picked from that big long list, how strongly do you feel that identity on a scale of zero to, to 10? So there's two things I think that flow from that. One is that if we look just at the forced choice, the pick one identity that best applies to you, what's been interesting to us is to track not just how much of a rise there has been in the proportion of people who would use uh, an English national identity as the label that they, they pick, but also over the same period to look at the, the fall in the proportion of people using a British national identity as something that would describe them. And however interesting we find the rise in English national identity, part of the story is there's been a far faster fall in the proportion using their British identity. And the other thing that we've done is we can compare that strength question and look at, right, how strongly English do you feel? How strongly British do you feel? And we can look at the relative strength of those things and we can then compare that to Moreno scales. And what we see is that even people who profess that they are English, not British, if you ask them on a zero to 10 scale to talk about how British they are, they're not all giving zero on that scale. They are retaining a sense of British identity. So they might say, oh, I'm three out of 10 or, or four out of 10. So one thing that's been helpful for us is to understand that the Moreno question is really good at simplifying the situation, but it exactly does that. It simplifies the situation and it strips a lot of the nuance out there. So that's why we, we, in the book, we talk through all the different measures that we have and then show how in different situations, different questions help you to understand what's going on and why. But reading the book, if you look at the sort of year to year figures on people feeling exclusively English or more English than British, it doesn't appear to be such a stark change. But in terms of strength of feeling, is that where this rise in English national sentiment has become more apparent? No, it's it's not so much in the strength. It's in it's in the relationship to Britishness. So it's okay. it's not. So there's been a, an increase in the proportion of people who describe themselves as English. But what's what's interesting is if you consider that within the context in which other people hold other in which people hold other identities. So it's not just the rise in Englishness. It's the rise in Englishness accompanied by the fall in Britishness, and that's part of what's part of what we say is going on because because we were interested you know your first question is why why are we doing this and one of the reasons why we're, we were doing this is because we wanted to take you know we wanted to take a book which provided us with an opportunity to talk about something over over many many more pages and really get into depth in terms of what was actually going on so we we, we didn't just want to to map out in punishing detail what is happening we also wanted to talk about what the consequences of that were and, and why these things were happening. And partly the consequences part is, is explained by the fact that it's not just a rise in Englishness, but, but a rise and the politicization of Englishness. English identity is salient to contemporary politics in a way that it hasn't been before. And also that salience is kind of leached out of Britishness in a way. Just, I mean, I think given that uh, we're, speaking to a, I don't know, predominantly Welsh audience, I have no idea, but there's a, there's a really nice Welsh example here. Between 1979 and 1997, the proportion of people in Wales saying they felt Welsh didn't change at all, basically. But what being Welsh meant politically 
fundamentally transformed, right? So in in 79, to be Welsh and be anti-devolution was, you know, normal. Whereas by 97, it became increasingly difficult for you to feel Welsh and to be anti-devolution. By now, it's really difficult. So the, the, what these, it's not just the relative kind of shifts back and forth in terms of the numbers. It's what's associated politically with those views. And so we spend a lot, no, not, there's a lot of, we spend a lot of time in the book teasing out the different measures and how they illustrate different things. But then it, what's crucial is then what political attitudes align with, with uh, I, these identities. And what we find is that English I, identity aligns with a lot. British identity aligns with almost nothing in England. So this is, this is you know, in terms of understanding what's going on, um, yeah. So we'll talk about the, the, the political aspect of this now. Well, there's a very interesting um, bit of the book that talks about the Conservative Party's relationship with, with Englishness. But let's talk about Labour for a little bit. Why do you think they're so bad at embracing Englishness? We spoke to John Denham a few months ago, and he said that Labour tends to talk about Britain when they mean England, because they think that's what Scottish nationalists want to hear. Why, why do you think England has been so... Why do you think Labour has been so bad at embracing this concept of Englishness? Well, that's probably a book in its own right, isn't it? Um, and, and I think you, we can only touch on elements of it. I think, you know, you, you mentioned possibly in jest that it's about not offending the Scots, but there's absolutely the case that in, in terms of Labour's internal politics, the most fervent advocates of English regionalism uh, found in the Labour Party in Scotland and in Wales, you know, and I think part of that, and I, 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 this may be cynical, and, and <laughs> Ilsa may, may may wish to, um, you know, write a written affidavit uh, disagreeing with this, but part of part of what's going on is, as I suspect, uh, an attempt to avoid the dilution of the role of Scottish and Welsh Labour MPs within uh, the House of Commons. So actually balancing in Scottish and Welsh devolution with English regionalism is very helpful internally for a particular group of politicians within the Labour Party. There's also um, this very, very long-standing um, idea that nationalism is inherently reactionary. And OK, maybe we've had to talk about it in the context or find a, a way of dealing with this in the Scottish and Welsh context, but we really don't want to transpose this to the English context, especially because, again, there's a view that English nationalism is particularly odious in some way. And, you know, and then you get these really, you know, Elsa and I have spoken at lots of Labour Party conferences over the, over the years at various fringe meetings, and you get people talking about the EDL, right? And, and then, you know, my stock response is to go, well, did you ever look at the National Front demonstrations in the 70s? They're all Union Jacks, OK? So the, the, the fact that they're waving a, a particular flag is, you know, you've got to, you've got to you know, deepen the ana analysis here. So I think there's lots of stuff going on here. But what the, the overall impact is that the Labour Party finds this territory really extremely uh, difficult. And we're seeing this, I think... And again, we're going beyond the book here, but we're seeing this very clearly at the moment with the comments that Keir Starmer has made about patriotism, which, which to my mind, and um, is clearly recognising that they have a problem that they need to address. You know, I think they do, but not really knowing how to do that, what the language to do that is, what, what is the patria, what is the country we're even talking about here. And so you end up with this kind of nations and regions or places near to you or whatever the ITV news stuff, you know. So the Labour Party's got real issues with this. And we've been trying to talk to the Labour Party via IPPR for 10 years and <laughs> we, got, we got nowhere. Yeah, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't disagree with any of... Well, yeah, I wouldn't disagree with most of that. What I would say is that I think I think part of what's I think part of what's going on is is an understanding of so, social solidarity, a, a sense that social solidarity is required in order to 
in order to sustain a welfare state and, a, and an assumption that social solidarity can only work if it operates at the level of the state. And so I think there's deep nervousness about any, and I think that's, I don't think it's necessarily anti-nationalism as a principled standpoint. I think it's, I think it's nervousness about what nationalism might do to statewide social solidarity. And then what then, what, pr what problems that then presents. So I think that's, that's part of, of what's going on. That said, there is, there is clearly deep nervousness about nationalism. You saw it just immediately after the, the devolution referendums in 1997, where having won the, where having won the referendums, you know, labor, certainly labor in Scotland appeared to you know, audibly stick the brakes on with a screeching halt and say, right, okay, having whipped this up, we need to, we need to put the brakes on. Let's be very careful about the building we use because we don't want it to be um, an excessively national symbol. So I think there's, I think it's partly to tied in with social solidarity. I think what then that, that is aligned with a kind of nervousness about what nationalism might do to social solidarity. But I think that understanding that some sort of statewide frame is essential is partly why Labour has found itself in a difficult situation, because I think there's been a deep reluctance to propose a solution for England until there is a kind of UK wide proposal for how you can think about governance in a way that doesn't undermine social solidarity. And I think that's part of the reason why there's been a delay in terms of coming up with something innovative about English governance. It's because there has been a deep reluctance to decouple that from understanding governance arrangements within the whole of the UK. And I think that's why the solutions we keep getting from the Labour Party are proposals for England within the context of those wider UK debates. And that's why the solution always is, well, what are we going to do about England? Well, let's just carve it up into a bunch of units that look pretty much about the size of Scotland. So we'll have these Scotland-sized units all over England. Plus we have Scotland, plus Wales, plus Northern Ireland, and surely that will that will satisfy us. And I think that's that's part of what's part of what's going on. I think it's a I think it's a social solidarity thing. I think that explains what's going on in terms of the approach to nationalism. And I think it's the 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 deep reluctance to think about one part in particular um, in favor of looking at the whole of the state. And because coming up with a solution for the whole of the state is so difficult, it's then led to a kind of lack of imaginative thinking for England alone. We've talked to you in the past, also about Scottish Labour's problem with embracing a, a sort of a Scottish Labour brand. Richard, do you think there's a, a comparison to be found in Welsh Labour to English and Scottish Labour? Who's, is it because there's a different nature to the nationalism or is it just because of a political decision making? Oof, that's, a, that's, a, that's an enormous question. I mean, part of it is the way that in Wales, Labour has become and has been for a very long time the national party, uh, you know, as, as Dennis Balsam and colleagues famously argued back in 1979 or just after 1979 that it it is it is the Conservative Party has been historically associated with English identity in Wales. Labour became the kind of the successor to that Welsh Liberal tradition. Plaid Cymru, for various reasons, could never shake that. And so Labour, by default, ended up there. There's also the salutary shock of 1999 and the way that they dealt with the what for them was the you know cataclysm of, of the first... Uh, devolved election when Labour was shocked to its very core and responded by, you know, very deliberately trying to be more like Plaid Cymru, basically. Don't don't see that ground to Plaid. Uh, and Scottish Labour, for, for reasons that Ilse has just uh, explained, they, they, they took the entirely different tack and I think lost out long term. And, you know, it, it is a, a curiosity, really, why the Labour Party as it tries to struggle with national identity politics, for one should, want of a better word, why the Labour Party in Scotland and in England are not more interested in its success in Wales and seeing what they can what they can learn from that. But you know, clearly they're not. And it looks very much as if the the whole kind of project around Stammer to think about 
radical federalism is very much focused on what can we learn from the Scottish Labour Party? And I'm going, hmm, <laughs> well, yes, that's not the obvious place to go, Keir, but you know, what do I know? Given that you've brought us quite neatly back on to, to deep evolution, to what extent do you think this rise in Englishness is as a consequence of devolution? Is there a devolution backlash? And also, how was this backlash weaponized by the Conservative Party in, in 2015? Yeah. Can I, 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 shall, shall I have a go first here? Well, can I go first? Because I know what you're going to say. <laughs> so okay. I can lead you there because we, dis we disagree. So I know what Rich is going to say and I disagree with it. So I'll get my, I'll get my two cents in first. <laughs> so I think you use the term backlash and I think that's, I think that's relevant here because there was a ton of public money spent in the period between 1999 and 2003 looking for an English backlash and kind of having found none, the public money dried up and, and people stopped looking at it until we, we came along and thought something's going on here so we need to start asking questions about this. But the result of it is that there appears to have been none in 2003, but there was definitely something going on in 2011. And, and we, we therefore cleverly think that something happened in between those two dates. And, and my working theory is that it's because of the SNP government in Edinburgh. And so before you had, you know, Labour-led administrations in Edinburgh and Cardiff, you had a Labour government in the, she can have said, and a, a, a Labour government in, in Westminster. And so it wasn't seen in, in quite the same way, but the arrival of an SNP government in Edinburgh making even more things free or continuing to have things free that had begun, you know, a, a process that had begun with a labor led administration in Edinburgh. I think that for, for some journalists and also for some politicians in Westminster, I, I personally think that that is a, an important part of the explanation for what's going on, but, but you will now hear the other view. Well, that is an alter. So, I mean, the, the serious point is that, because of the 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 you know the paucity of data, we don't know, right? So we, you know, this is why Ilse and I can can disagree uh, merrily about this and and have done for years. So my view is that it's there, there are a couple of things going on. First of all, it's as devolution beds in in both Scotland and Wales, you've got social democrat social democratic governments in a period of kind of public spending largesse, using their spending power to change the package of public services available in Scotland and in Wales as compared to England, okay? And the, the free stuff that, that Ilsa is talking about, you know, and this is anecdotal, but I've been very struck when we've spoken about this in front of various non-academic audiences, the sense of a front around free prescriptions and the sense of, well, it's not fair. There's something fundamentally unjust about you getting stuff that we don't. And then I think, and this is probably where Ilse and I, and I, I, don't, we, I, I suspect we don't disagree about that. What we disagree on is I, I suspect that Gordon Brown becoming prime minister is at least as important as the SNP uh, gaining power in, in Edinburgh, because what you see very, very clearly is the, the right-wing media, the, the kind of newspapers in particular, this becomes, this becomes a running saw, it's a running issue uh, in those newspapers that you've got this Scottish Prime Minister, and we know that there's a, you know, our data shows this huge resentment at Scottish undue influence, a real, very, you know, overwhelming support for English votes, for English laws. You know what precisely that means is it's a, it's a better slogan than it is a policy, arguably. But I think that that whole period is key, and I you know I think there's something really quite interesting about and you you mentioned 2015, and I think there's something quite interesting about the the Conservative and Unionist Party and its outriders in all of this because I think they've delegitimated Scottish politicians playing a role at the centre of the state, which raises fundamental questions about the future of the state. They also, in 2015, weaponized very deliberately English grievance and English resentment, not just at the SNP, not just at the, the idea of Ed Miliband being in Sturgeon or Salmon's pocket, but more generally 
English grievance about Scotland. They weaponized it in 2015 as well. Again, meaning that it's, you know, it's very, very hard to foresee, unless something changes, how you can have serious Scottish influence at the centre of the state anymore. And, you know, and then how, do you, how does the state then survive? So you know, there's, there's something deeply ironic, to say the least, and I'm being very diplomatic, about the way that self-proclaimed unionist politicians make the continuation of the union more and more difficult. And, and what was so interesting for us, I think, when we were looking at this, you know, when we were looking at what happened in, in, in 2015, you know, we know that those involved in the campaign said the reason we were using the SNP is because the English don't like to be ruled by foreigners, right? So, so the SNP were the, the SNP were a symbol of foreign influence. And the foreign influence there was not the SNP itself as a party, it was Scotland. It was Scotland's influence. So it was using the SNP's image as a code for this is undue Scottish influence. So afterwards we went looking and we wanted to see, right, did the English electorate make a distinction, a meaningful distinction between undue influence of SNP members and undue influence of, of Scottish MPs at all? And, and I suppose the reassuring finding is that yes, they do distinguish between the undue influence of SNP MPs and the undue influence of Scottish MPs. But it's still the case that over a third of the English electorate believes that no Scottish MP should ever be in government, right? And if that's the case, if, the, if, if a sizable proportion of the majority electorate within the state believes that no politician from any of the other electorates should ever get to sit in government on the back of a campaign that primed for that in 2015, then you have put your union in a rather precarious position. And I think that's why when people talk about a precious union, that is that claim is viewed with, with some suspicion outside of England. Do you think that England would ever accept a government of the UK that didn't have a majority in England? In my view, uh, this, is, uh, look, this is speculative, right? Um, but um, my reading of the evidence is no, and certainly not for anything beyond a very short period. Because this stuff is so easily mobilizable. And you know, it's that government would almost inevitably be a government of the center left, given what we know about political choices around different parts of the states. And and we know that at the center of the states, the right is very, very, very happy to weaponize this stuff. It's done so constantly. And you know, I mean, even at, I mean, if you let's 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 fast forward a few years and there's a UK general election. And if we've got the kind of current state of the polls is transposed forward, um, what you're looking at is, you know, the Tories losing 40 odd seats on, on current polling. So you're getting into the territory where Labour could form some kind of coalition with the other parties from the fringe. <laughs> no, that is so easily weaponized by the Conservatives and there's no reason to think that they will stop. Um, you know, Brexit, Brexit is a very another really excellent example of just the way that Brexit has been prosecuted is arguably in the way that is most damaging of the union. So you know, there's an economic border between Britain and Northern Ireland. The devolved governments have been systematically excluded from the whole process, even when in the Welsh case they've bent over backwards to be constructive. And yet the UK government has done exactly what they wanted to do. And our polling subsequent to the stuff that's in the book shows that, you know, 85% of Conservative supporters in England are quite happy to see the end of the union in order to get Brexit done. So, you know, th this, this doesn't look like, to me, a state where there would be some kind of self-imposed vow of silence uh, if there was a, a, a government that didn't have a majority in England. What do you say to people, though, who highlight people like Michael Gove and Annalise Dodds uh, as being, you know, quite high up figures within the major UK political parties? Do you think it's OK that Scottish people are involved in UK politics as long as they represent seats in Surrey and Oxfordshire? We don't poll on that kind of blood and belonging sort of stuff. So we don't mm. we haven't we haven't gone looking. I, I think. 
you know, if people are thinking of Liam Fox, I don't think they're necessarily thinking Scottish politician Liam Fox. I think they're just thinking of Liam Fox, who represents a constituency in England. I, I don't think they're sure. thinking, oh, Liam Fox originally comes from East Kilbride, right? So sure. I don't I don't think people are I think that I think the concern about the union is about structural what it, what is perceived to be structural benefits for Scotland. I don't think it's I don't think it manifests itself as kind of ad hominem opposition to people who happen to be Scottish. I don't and, and that's also one of the reasons why, you know, people sometimes say, well, what what about um, anti-Scottish prejudice? Is that going on? We've tended not to poll on that or to, to ask questions about that. Not not because we think it's completely absent. But I think because our, our data have led us to believe that a lot of this is reactions to structural benefits and what are perceived to be kind of structural penalties for certain electorates. Mm -hmm. So we don't go looking to see whether, with, uh, with, you know, some of the questions that you get asked in, in surveys run by sometimes sociologists, you know, would you be happy if your son or daughter married someone who was Scottish? So we don't, we don't tend to ask about that interpersonal level stuff. We're looking at the we're looking at the political arrangements of the state, what preferences people have for those arrangements, and whether there's anything structural going on in terms of whether people th think that things are going right and going going poorly. And so as a, and so by extension, we then don't go into looking at, you know, do you like this politician because um, because of this or that, or do you not like this politician because of this or that? Going back onto uh, the Brexit. If you if if it's arguable that during the 2015 general election, English national sentiment was whipped up by the Conservatives yeah. in order to say, for example, Emmy the Band in Sturgeon or Salmon's pocket, is there any truth to the proposition that this sort of came back to haunt the Conservative government when the referendum came around? That this you mentioned in the book, this sort of dissatisfaction in England with people like Sturgeon who was prominent in the Remain campaign. Did things like this come back to yeah, all uh, the Conservatives during the Brexit referendum? Yeah, one of the, one of the things which I think is, is um, a bit... One of the things I quite like about the book is that we, we, we treat the 2015 general election and 2016 uh, Brexit referendum as linked. And you know, so much of, for obvious reasons, after 2016, Basically, everything in British politics has been about the response to that referendum, and we've it's been continual crisis. And the thing that actually sparked the referendum, which is the unexpected Conservative victory in the 2015 general election, has been completely ignored. You know, there's very little academic literature certainly focusing on that um, vote, and yet it was the unexpected success that meant that Cameron's pledged to hold a referendum if they won the majority, which apparently he thought he would never, he would never be in a position to operationalise. It was that that then leads to the 2016 uh, referendum. And, and for us, the kind of intellectual puzzle is, how is it the same people who respond to these prompts around Scottishness in 2015 uh, end up voting for leave in a campaign where England doesn't feature at all, right? No, basically England is not mentioned. And so we, this is one of the things that we try to, to kind of pull out and, and, and try to understand. But in terms of the, the 16 referendum, there's, all, there's so many, it, it, I mean, it's so interesting. You, you could, we could spend an hour just talking about the relationship between the two things. So for example, it's, you know, the way that Remain runs that, genuinely dreadful uh, campaign in 2016, not learning any of the lessons of, of the 2015 campaign. So they basically run the Remain campaign as if Britain was this happily multicultural, multinational country, and they have these prominent Scots everywhere. And you're going, you know, hang on, <laughs> you just ran a general election dumping on Scotland. How do you think everybody's forgot? You know, anyway, so there are all kinds of things going on here. But for us, the, the kind of key puzzle is it's the, the ability of a campaign focused on Englishness to mobilise those people in a campaign that talks only about Britishness. And so it's, in a sense, that's what sets up uh, the book. And that's then we try and we show actually, well, yes, English nationalism has got these two sides. 
the English side and the British side. And the people who hold this view don't see any contradiction here. You know, Welsh nationalists will say, well, that, that's, that, that's somehow illegitimate. How can you be both? You have to choose. But actually, that's not how the people who hold this identity, who hold these views, they don't view this as in any way contradictory. Ailsa, is there much care for the union in England? Is there much of a, if you poll, and I suppose the real question is, does that vary between people who identify as British and those who identify as English? Hmm. Yeah, that's a great question. No, is the answer. So um, we, the book kind of stopped, we, because we had to artificially stop ourselves, otherwise we would have never finished. I mean, this, this book took us ages anyway. So if we'd kept adding in new data, we never would have, we never would have finished. So we had to kind of artificially halt it at a certain point, but we have kept ourselves in the field. So we've still been doing um, annual surveys. And, and one, of the, one of those questions that we developed was um, one that Richard mentioned earlier. So thinking in terms of Brexit um, and looking at the possible Brexit consequences, how is it worth it? Is Brexit worth it if these things happen? If support, if, you know, if there's another independence referendum in Scots vote yes, or if there's another border poll and folks in Northern Ireland vote to, to reunite with Ireland. And, and as Richard said earlier, you know, we know that people who, who voted leave, we also know that conservative voters in general were far more likely to say, yeah, it's worth it. Even if there are these radical changes to the union, Brexit will have been worth it. But I think one thing that's also worth mentioning is we replicated that on the Remain side. And if we told Remainers that they could get their own way on Brexit, would they also put up with these fairly radical changes to the union? And they were also supportive, right? So it's not just a lever thing. It's not just that levers are kind of ambivalent to the union. It's people are willing to put up with radical changes to the union to get their own way, to get to get what they want out of the Brexit debate. They, if, if they are told that tomorrow you could have what you want, will you put up with these radical changes? And, and a majority on both sides say yes. So that's one thing, it's tied to Brexit. But the other thing we know is that we've started to, you know, we've been polling on support for independence, whether people want independence for their own part, but also, how people feel about independence for other parts of, um, of the UK. And we've, we've started asking also about how important the union is to people. So we have this question that I've been calling the kind of ambivalent unionism question. So we say to people, right, which, which is, comes closest to your view? The union is a priority for me and I want it to stay as it is. Uh, I want independence for my part, and I'm paraphrasing the options, or I don't want independence for my part, but if one or more other parts of the UK want to go their own way, then so be it, right? This kind of ambivalent unionism question. And what we find is that ambivalent unionism is highest in England. It's over, it's over a third of the electorate. Sometimes it's over 40% of the English electorate is in this ambivalent unionism camp, you know? So I don't want English independence, but the rest of you can go away and leave us the state to ourselves. Richard, there's many who advocate federalism as a means of saving the UK. You mentioned it earlier, radical federalism. Most of the time they struggle to address the question of England. Yeah. Does England want more devolution for itself? Does it want to be split apart into regional parliaments or have its own English parliament? Could it, is there any desire for federation? Uh, I think, in a word, no. Um, that's an unusually forthright answer for an academic. So let me let me qualify that a bit. So I mean, this is something that there's a there's a, a chapter in in the book that discusses various schemes put forward to to accommodate England, as we put it. And you know, there's there's no doubt that there's a long there's a long history of people advocating some kind of regional solution for England and then that is seen by unionists in Scotland and Wales as a way of balancing uh, the states and 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 you know I, I at a personal level I, I find it very I kind of find it fascinating because you know for me the arguments for devolving power decentralizing power within England are pretty overwhelming in that this looks like a pretty centralized uh, 
state and you know my my instinct is well you know how about decentralizing this but what we've um our research consistently shows very low levels of supports for any kind of regional solution and then when we when we presented this these findings in the past people have said well you're you're looking at the wrong region okay so basically it's the wrong you people are not interested in ons kind of standard regions try something else so we then we 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 use these kind of broad categories the north the midlands nothing doing there okay that was there was, that was no better then it was all city regions was the thing for a while and it turns out that, that the only thing which was less popular than uh, regions were city regions so we kept kind of looking for this and and you know um the, i think the, the basic story of this is that yes regional identity is a thing in england people have got a strong sense of locale and that that is meaningful but it doesn't kind of then read across into a sense that we need political boundaries territorial boundaries that match if we could work out what these regional boundaries are they don't fit together so you can feel strongly i don't know geordie or whatever or whatever regional identity you have without thinking that that necessarily means that we need a layer layer of government that that um that reflects that so um and what the what you then get is and i think the 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 because if you've got this absence of public support what we've seen is this really sorry history of continual churn where we've seen for a long period of time now new regional structures being developed in a kind of confusion of boundaries with a confusion of powers very little clarity about what they are what they do the next minister comes in changes it all i mean george osborne's ideas have now been thrown out every government comes in with something new and nothing settles um and you know, and I suspect that that doesn't change moving forward. You know, I, I know that some people in the Labour Party are now saying this is the hour, Andy Burnham, King of the North. Everything has changed. Um, you know, maybe I don't. You know, I'm not. I'm not a prophet, but looking at the, the uh, looking at the data that we've been looking at over a period of time, I suspect not. Yeah, so, what about an English Parliament? Uh, is there any danger actually that an English Parliament would be? too big lots of people always say that and it could pose some sort of existential danger to the union because it is so big and dominant well i think i think your question kind of hits at the two the two dimensions one is whether you know what is the territorial scale of the primary political community for people in england and then what are the consequences of those attitudes right so the first part of the answer is in, as in, as Richard was saying, you know, England is the is the territorial scale at which people want some sort of governance solution. They don't want something at the regional level. They don't want some sort of solution, some adaptation at the UK level. They want they want something for England as England, right? But that then raises all kinds of all kinds of concerns. One thing that I found quite interesting going back through for fun the other day, I was reading all our evil questions and the number of times we've we've asked about English votes for English laws. We've asked like 13 different ways about English votes for English laws. And one thing that I found really interesting was that when we first, um, when we first started asking people what governance arrangements they wanted best, support for an English parliament was somewhere around 40%. I mean, it was incredibly high. And, you know, we, as with identity, we ask a number of different ways, but this was back in the days where we were just saying, here's a list of possible things we might do, which, which one on this list do you like the best, right? So that was incredible support for an English parliament at a time when no, no major party was advocating one. So it's, it's not like it was responding to debates at the time. But we changed as we do, we, we change these governance questions so that they're roughly in line with what parties are also suggesting. And when we started asking about English votes for English laws and adaptations to, to Westminster, we found that that sucked a lot of the support out of an English parliament. So, so there's on the one hand, there is a clear sense that there needs to be some sort of solution for England as England. There was incredibly high support for an English parliament, 
but when we started also offering it alongside a reformed UK Parliament that had English votes for English laws, we saw support for that increase and support for an English Parliament drop. So there's there's nuance in the data. There's there's kind of not quite contradictory findings, but there's certainly nuance that leads us to believe that there's a there's a hunger for something but it's still quite an ill-formed thing that people want, right? And I think part of that is tied to the problem of, of what an English parliament might do in terms of, of the UK, but it's, it's also, people want a solution for England, but they're just not quite sure what that English thing is. And it cuts also along with data, you know, we were finding that anytime we, we we put an option in there that had English at the start, it polled better. So naming is important. There is a clear sense that it's something to do with a very particular territorial scale, but beyond that, preferences are quite malleable, I think. And we found that as well with Scotland after the 2014 referendum, you know, we were polling on a number of different options that people were discussing around the time of the Smith Commission. And whereas it was actually quite difficult to knock people off their preferences around independence, if you're talking about post-independent post independence referendum arrangements, like what do you want to do with Scotland now that it's not going to be independent? What's the solution? Preferences are really malleable. It's actually really easy to knock people off their preferences in terms of the way you frame the question, in terms of the information you give people before you ask them. And we're, we're in that situation in England and have been for a while. Um, but we're also, I mean, the English are not unique there. That's also true. Um, that's also true in Scotland. Do you think that questions of identity and national identity have become a more salient cleavage to voters than issues of class? Or do you still think it's a, I think you, you, you question whether it's still the preserve of the chattering classes in the book. What do you think? The thing about uh, national identity is it doesn't kind of throw float freely i mean the, the key the key chapter in the book the kind of hinge of the the book is a, a chapter on the english worldview and it shows how certain values and attitudes and preferences are very closely tied to a particular sense of national identity and so and f f uh, you know in terms of the work that uh I do on Wales with my colleagues uh, in Cardiff in terms of the work that I do with Ilsa and I'm sure in terms of the work that Ilsa does in Scotland. It's how these things um, match together uh, in a two and, and how ultimately they can be mobilised by a particular narrative uh, into a, some kind of political force. That, that's the interesting thing. So it's not national identity fr f uh, freely fr floating. That's not the point. It's how it ties to other things, and we saw that in uh, we saw that in the Brexit referendum, we saw that in the independence referendum in 2014 in Scotland, arguably, and and you know I think that's what we very clearly saw in the 2019 general election in the very successful Conservative campaign. It's how you tie these things together into a narrative that matters, and I think that the importance of national identity in that, and that is, is kind of all I think it's often overlooked is it, it's, it allows you to create particular narratives, which are really powerful and which link to all kinds of other things in society, which give them legitimation. So th for, for me, that's, what you're, that's, that's the key in terms of understanding all of this. It's how these things link together and how they are mobilized by particular political forces and how other political forces just fail to mobilize them. We, we spoke about what, you know, what, what is the thing that unites despite their manifest differences the SNP in Scotland the Conservative Party in England and Labour in Wales they're really really good at articulating a story about national identity and these other values and preferences and all of their opponents really struggle by comparison. I'd, I'd agree with that I think one thing we were you know we were trying to do with the book is not to say that that English national identity or national identity in general is important and nothing else is. I think one, one frustration we had was that national identity was portrayed as something that was relevant, but only for the little ditty electorates around the, around the edges. And it was something that wasn't, um, wasn't relevant at all to that, the, 
um, the core, uh, the core large electorate in the in, in the in the middle there. So one thing we were trying to do was say, hang on, it's relevant here as well, right? And that that's one thing we were absolutely trying to to demonstrate and to show how it interacts with uh, how it interacts with other things, um, and also how it helps to frame debates about about who we about our past, about our present, about about where we're going, how it ties into understandings of of national difference. And also with that comparative chapter, trying to show how not just English and Scottish and Welsh identities can lead you into different directions, but also just how British identity in the way that it's manifesting itself in Scotland and Wales and in England is also leading people in different directions, right? So British national identity aligns with not just different, but polar opposite constitutional preferences in different parts of the state. So it's not that national identity is important and none of these other things are. It's that national identity is an important part of the, of the story and not just in the places where you go looking for it. It's also, it's also been present for a very long time, uh, for a very long time in England. Uh, well, thank you very much to Professors Elsa Henderson and Richard Wynne Jones for coming to talk to us today about their fantastic book, Englishness. Uh, if you've enjoyed anything of what you've heard today, it is a must read. If you also want to find anything that we're doing here at Here I, please don't forget to find us on Medium at Here I Blog Cymru, on Facebook at Here I Blog Cymru, and on Twitter at Here I Blog. Thank you for listening to Here I. If you like what you heard, please don't forget to subscribe, rate and review.